Will you please be seated? <coughs> Let us pray. O Holy Spirit, whose presence is liberty, grant us that freedom of the Spirit which will not fear to tread in unknown way. Nor be held back by misgivings of ourselves, fear of others. Ever beckon us forward to the place of your will, which is also the place of your power. Amen. Examining a toy for a child. And the salesman says to her, It's quite a toy, isn't it? And she says, Well, it seems quite complex for a small child. He said, Oh, you you just don't understand. This is one of those learning Toys. They learn to live in our modern age. No matter how they build it, it will be wrong. Life seems like that, doesn't it? Sometimes, no matter how we go about it, it just doesn't come out like we planned. In case you did not pick up on it, the disciples are not immune to the storms of life. They call it the mid-watch in the Navy. The mid-watch, they come and get you out of the rack at about 11.30 at night to get ready to stand watch from the hours 12 to 4 a.m. And all who have ever stood mid-watches know it is not the most wonderful time of the day. It is during the mid-watch when they are the weakest or the sleepiest or the least likely able to deal with conflict that the storm comes. The Sea of Galilee is known for how quickly storms arise and the severity of those storms, even though it is a small freshwater sea. When they are weakest, like when we are weakest, storms come. When we are at least capable of handling them, they come. It is often said that bad things come in three. I don't understand why, but it seems to be so. If I have one electronic device break, there will be two more to follow. If one thing goes wrong with my home, there will be two more to follow. And it usually happens either while I'm on vacation or having spent all my money as soon as I come back from vacation. And we chuckle, but you know what I'm talking about. It was during the mid-watch that the storm came. The small boat in which the disciples were in was tossed about like a matchbox. They are frightened. You and I are so familiar with this story, perhaps we can never hear it again. The French philosopher, theologian Paul Ricoeur says, We have become so familiar with biblical texts that we can no longer hear them. 
And yet, he says, the text wants to speak to us anew. How many of us think we know the punchline? Peter gets out of the boat, and he begins to doubt, and Jesus chides him for doubting. And for years we have preached this sermon to clergy, or we have interpreted it in small, small bits of morality. Just don't you doubt. Always believe what Jesus says. But let's listen again, as if for the first time. This very interesting when Jesus story about when Jesus came at mid-watch. The disciples, for the purpose of Christ's ministry and the spread of the gospel, all have different personalities. You ever notice how many different personalities have particular fears? In Greek, the word is phobia. Fear is a phobia. To Peter, James, and John, who are fishermen, and I expect they experience something different than do perhaps Andrew or Thomas or Matthew. Peter, James, and John are worried perhaps about the boat sinking. Being fishermen, most likely they could grab hold of a piece of wood and float to shore, but they are more concerned, perhaps, about how will they earn their living if their boat goes down. Now, Matthew, being a land lover, is probably thinking in there, I knew it, never get on a boat. Thomas, who uses rational law, He's the one that said, I have to see it to believe it. He's probably thinking, if God meant us to be on the waters, he would have given us fins and gills. I knew it. We shouldn't be on the boat. Andrew, who seems to be the extroverted personality, always bringing someone to Jesus, is probably thinking about all the friends he will never see again and all the loved ones who will miss him. You see, our fears are personal. What scares you may not scare me. There are literally hundreds of phobias listed. Do you know there is a fear of the number eight, octophobia? And yes, there is a fear of bad people. Pelotophobia. People who see my hair fall out are becoming more pelotophobic every day. There are those who fear bicycles. Cyclophobia. And yes, there's one that's more universal. Fear of dentist. Dentophobia. I didn't make this up. These are real things. And the thing about our fears, they seem to isolate us from others who do not share in the same fear. What are you afraid of? Now, there are treatments. There is therapy to help you with your phobia to manage your phobia. Perhaps a fear of bald people. The way you manage is shut your eyes when one comes by. And in this congregation, you would probably be shutting your eyes more frequently than in others. But because of our fears, we are isolated in them. And in a sense, we suffer alone. But underneath every one of those phobias, I would say, there is a universal fear. It's the cause of all of our smaller phobias. It 
is the fear of our own finiteness. Our own smallness. Our own limited time in life. It is the understanding that we and ourselves are limited by time, by space, and even by our own gifts. And then Jesus came. The storm during the midwatch. And they thought Jesus was a ghost. Now, ancients had this superstition, some scholars believe, that when you started seeing dead people, you were pretty close to being dead yourself. It frightened them because of the storm on the lake, and now they see the ghost. It is an omen that they are getting ready to pass into the great beyond. Our own demise. And I'm not just talking about death. I'm talking about the implications of being finite. Will anyone remember me? Are we but a flower that blooms today and in the heat of the morrow wither away and no one knows? Sometimes when we really wrestle with how finite human beings are, we feel that our lives don't really matter. If they don't matter, we just simply pass into non-existence when we breathe our last. Paul Tillich calls it the fear of non-being. And all of us face it. We, or at least we know of it or have questioned it in those silent hours when we or in our bed at night and cannot sleep, are we but dust in the wind? Underneath all of our external little phobias, there is this thread of non-being and its estrangement in life, and even in death. And often, when we are drowning in a sea of phobias, we never really deal with the root cause. We simply deal with the symptoms. And Peter says, Lord, if it is really you, let me come to you on the water. Now, we're so accustomed to hearing, do you know how strange that is? I'm going to get out of the boat in the middle of the rising sea. There's this great story. I think Jack, you'll appreciate this, being a pilot. A number of years ago in California, of course, there was this retired guy, and he had a lawn chair in the backyard, and he wondered what would happen to the lawn chair if he filled ten balloons up with helium. So he puts these ten balloons and fills them, they're big balloons, with helium. And, 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 and the chair lifts off the ground. He thought that was neat. I wonder what would happen if I put 60. Now you know where this story is going. He has a friend help him fill... Sixty balloons full of helium. He gets in the lawn chair, and he says, let me go. And he thought he would go up ten feet. Flight 411 is coming into Los Angeles International Airport, and the control tower uh, hears this. This is Captain. Jones for Flight 411. I think I need to report. 
that there's a guy in a lawn chair at about 3,000 feet. This really happened. I mean, you know, these things are so weird, they have to be true. Well, finally, the man decides to pop some of the balloons. He comes down, and a host of reporters surround him. What were you thinking? Why did you do this? And he gave an astute answer. Well, you have to do something. That's one of those existential answers. Fear comes. We often just have to do something. In the face of our finite the threat of not existence. We have to do something, anything, often. So many of our own obsessions are filling that void. We're doing something to fill up this fear of a hollow existence. Doing something, we say, gives us some kind of meaning in life. So we eat too much, drink too much, play too much, spend too much to fill this, this, this void. And it often turns on us and exacerbates our own feelings of worthlessness. Peter got on the boat. Got out of the boat. Just do something. And here's the turn. And the perspective that I would say that is different. We've always been taught that Jesus is saying to him, because when he gets out there and he starts sinking, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And we always attach that to Peter's sinking. But if you remember what Jesus did, he came to them and told them, Do not be afraid, it is I. And Peter says, well, if it's really you, let me walk on the water. Sounds like Thomas later, doesn't it? Prove it. And I would say to you that that's the doubt. Before he even got out of the boat, Jesus, And he comes in our own mid-watches, in our storms of life. And Jesus came. Jesus still comes by the power of God's Spirit to our lives. Now, we can chide Peter for not having the great faith. But I want you to know the salvation of Peter does not rise or fall on his faith because when he began to seek and realize, Lord, save me, immediately, the text says, post haste, Jesus reached out and grabbed him. We all have our personal fears. I encourage you to evaluate those. And perhaps fears underneath are really the universal, is really the universal fear. That maybe God just doesn't care enough. That we are nobody. We are non-being. 
We are accidents. We are dust in the wind. But the good news is that Jesus came. He came to the disciples. And even when our own fickle faith fails, Jesus reaches out and grabs. And maybe that's what true faith is. Is to allow Jesus to relieve our fears when we can no longer muster the things. In the storm. Jesus came. Jesus come. And Jesus will come again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand?